Hi, I'm Saeed Maluchifar. This is the presentation for our work. Nurakrib is not private. This is a joint work with Nicholas, Sanjam, Somesh, Mohammed, and Florian. Let's start with the problem setup and the goal of Nurakrib. We have a two party setting, Alice and Bob. Alice has access to a labeled data set and Bob has access to a learning algorithm, and the goal is to train a model on Alice's data without uh, revealing too much information about uh, that data. So the way it works is that Alice first locally encodes her data using some encoding algorithm that can potentially take keys, and sends this data to Bob. Bob trains a model on top of these encodings and sends it back to Alice, and now Alice can use this uh, model, but she can use it only in a very specific way. That is, she should first encode the input to the model, uh, and only then she can expect to see high utility from this model. Note that these encodings are, are only done on top of the uh, instances themselves, and labels are not uh, uh, encoded. Labels are uh, visible in the plane, and that's why we call it private learning with instance encoding. Nurakrib was a recent proposal that uh, tried to achieve this goal using uh, encoding algorithms that use random neural networks. How does that work? Well, we have an encoding algorithm that uses random neural networks as keys. Um, so nothing else is going to change. The learning algorithm is a typical learning algorithm that you use to train neural networks. But the encoding algorithm is something that uses a random neural network to map images to their encodings. So there, there are two algorithms. The first algorithm is the key generation that generates a key for you for, for the encoding. This is basically just randomly sampling a neural network with random weights. And the encoding is also very simple given a random neural network that you sample in the key generation step and also an input X, you just run X on, on that neural network and the output will be your encoding. You should also specify the privacy definition that NeuralCrypt tries to achieve. Uh, so they define this notion of perfect privacy for a keyed encoding function that uh, says, uh, that calls, we call a encoding function perfectly private if for any two uh, instances with the same label, the output distribution of the encoding uh, is almost the same when you sample the key freshly from your uh, key generation algorithm. And when I say almost the same, I mean it should be indistinguishable by a computationally unbounded adversary. For example, in this case of uh, cat images, if I feed the encoding function with two different cat images, the distribution of encodings uh, should be uh, identical uh, for any two cat images. Right now that they define their security definition, they should also argue why NeuraCrypt satisfies that definition. To do that, they first show the existence of an ideal encoding mechanism that is basically a proof of concept for their security definition. So what they show is that this ideal encoding satisfies the perfect privacy definition, and at the same time, it could be used for uh, learning. So the idea behind this is very simple. It's just, you can think of this encoding as a random mapping between all ma cat images in the universe. So it's basically a random bijection between all images with the same label. And uh, you can show that by doing this uh, trick, you can actually achieve perfect privacy. And you can also use this for learning because um, you are not removing the important features. You're just replacing one cat with another cat. And it, it should potentially be useful for learning. So this is, this is a proof of concept, but um, how is it related to NeuraCrypt? Well, they say they, they hope that NeuraCrypt approximates this ideal encoding. To, to support their claims about the privacy of NeuraCrypt, they, they released two challenge datasets. The first challenge is a set of 10,000 images with their encodings uh, that are shuffled, and they ask the adversary to, ma uh, to basically find the matching between the images and their encodings. 
And the second challenge uh, is, is a different one. So it, it gives the adversary only the set of encodings and ask the adversary to come up with an approximation of the key that was used to do these encodings. In this work, we break challenge one. We design an attack that can solve the challenge one of neural crypt. So the bottom two rows in this figure uh, are, are our results on neural crypt challenge, which achieves 100% accuracy. We also instantiate new challenges on our own data set, uh, ImageNet in particular, and we change the security parameter uh, uh, for, to be even beyond what they recommended. And in all those settings, we still get 100% accuracy. So this shows that um, NeuroCrypt is not, uh, it's not hard to solve challenge one for NeuroCrypt. Well, how does our attack work? Um, so the high level idea that we want to use in our attack is that in, when you instantiate a random neural network, you would expect some statistical invariance in different layers of this neural network. That, uh, so, so you would expect some statistics to be preserved uh, between the input and the output of your random neural network, and we want to use that in our benefit. To be more concrete, our attack has three main steps. The first step is where we train an embedding function that maps uh, images and their encoding into the same space with two properties. The first property that we want is that the, uh, the, an image and its encoding are very close to each other in the embedding space. And at the same time, any two different image are far, images are far away from each other in the embedding space. If you have these two properties, we can we'll see how we can break a uh, neural crypt challenge in the remaining steps. Uh, but uh, we should also discuss how we find such an embed. Well, we just train it on our own uh, image data set uh, that we encode according to uh, neural crypt specification. We, we define a loss function that is appropriate to solving this task and neural networks can uh, successfully do that for us. But one key detail here is that we don't um, give the image description, the pixel-wise description of the images to neural network. We just calculate the moment vectors of images and the encodings. So the neural network decides on the embeddings just based on these embedding, uh, these moment vectors. Uh, so this means that the neural network is actually finding some statistical invariance between, between the input and output of a neural, random neural network. After getting this embedding, the remaining steps are simple. In the second step of the attack, we just construct a similarity graph between images and their encodings. So we have a number of images, we have a number of encodings. For each pair of them, we calculate their distance in the embedding space. And then after constructing this graph, we try to, in the third step, just find the maximum matching in this bipartite graph, and that will be the output of our attack. And as we saw, this attack uh, uh, solves neural crypt challenge with 100% accuracy. You might now ask, what about challenge two? Um, let's first recall what challenge two was. Challenge two was that we have an encoded data set. And the goal is to find a, a, a key that approximates the actual key that was used to come up with this encoded data. And the approximation is done in a very specific way based on the nearest neighbor uh, of, in the encoding space. Um, we did not make an attempt to break challenge two because of two main reasons. First, challenge two is not necessary for privacy. You might have a, a encoding algorithm that is completely fine in revealing the in, encoding key or encryption key. Uh, like if you if you imagine you have a public key encryption algorithm, it's pri perfectly private even if you reveal the uh, the, uh, the public key. Uh, so this is not necessary. We also show that challenge two is not even sufficient for privacy. So we prove that there exists an encoding mechanism that reveals the whole input in plane. So it's not private at all. But at the same time, it's provably secure in in challenge two. So this construction is very simple. 
you just take a, a, a input x, you take a key a k, and you run uh, uh, cryptographically secure pseudo random function on x and k. And as long as the pseudo random function output uh, has a long output, then you can uh, you can show that this challenge cannot be solved by any adversary. So this shows that actually neural crypt could be hard in challenge two. We could try to solve the challenge two for neural crypt for years, and at all the time it was actually not private at all. So we don't even try to break it because we don't think that has uh, uh, anything to do with the privacy of neural crypt, specifically because challenge one is already showing that neural crypt is not private. So far, we showed NeuroCrypt is not private, um, but if you remember, they had an ideal encoding mechanism that they proved to be private uh, according to their definition. And so one question that remains is, is there any approximation of this ideal encoding? NeuroCrypt is not a good approximation, but is there any other approximation? Um, so the, if you remember, this ideal encoding was uh, a very simple mapping between uh, a CAD image to another CAD image. So if you give me a CAD image, the encoding of that will be just another random CAD image in, among all CAD images in the universe. So we asked if there is possible for an encoding uh, algorithm to approximate this ideal encoding. Um, here we show a barrier against approximating the ideal encoding mechanism. So what we show is that if an encoding algorithm approximates the ideal encoding for a concept function C, uh, it's important to note that the ideal encoding is defined for a specific task. So concept function is the task that we want to solve, and the ideal encoding is defined based on that. For example, the, the uh, ideal encoding that we saw in previous slide was defined for the task of predicting dog from cat. All right, so if we have an encoding that approximates the ideal encoding for concept function C, then there is a polynomial time algorithm with Oracle access to this encoder that can extract the whole concept function by just querying this uh, encoding algorithm. Well, why is this a barrier? This is a barrier because this shows the the encoding function must already know the concept function. So the concept function should be somehow embedded inside this uh, uh, encoding algorithm. And this means that uh, there is no point in trying to learn the concept function from data. You could just send this encoding algorithm to the other party, and the other party could just query that and find out what is the concept function and send it to you. Our proof here has three main steps. The first step is where we try to create a data set from the encoder. So what we do is, let's say we start from a cat image and a dog image, and we try to encode these using the encoding algorithm with different keys. By doing that, because of the properties of the ideal encoding, we should end up with new uh, fresh cat and dog images. And this means we can expand just single cat and single dog image to a large data set of cats and dogs. Now that we have this large data set, we can apply our learning algorithm on top of this to learn a classifier H that has some accuracy, at least some accuracy better than random. And now in the third step, we're gonna boost the accuracy of this classifier to be almost 100% accurate. So what we do is we, given a test instance X, we again run the encoding algorithm on x with different keys. For example, if it's a dog, the encoding algorithm should give us now a number of dogs. And after that, I'm going to give all these dogs to the hypothesis or the classifier and take the majority work. So as long as the, the accuracy of the classifier is better than random, I can basically get the correct prediction with uh, extremely high probability and this means that I can get 100% accuracy uh, on C by doing this trick and extract the whole C from the encoding itself. Uh, now to summarize, what we showed is that NeuroCrypt is not private uh, as it doesn't satisfy the, def the privacy definition of first challenge. We showed that their second challenge is not necessary or sufficient for privacy. 
And we also showed that any approximation of the ideal encoding is impossible. That's it. Thanks.